Hello, hi, what's up? It's me, Karen, your favorite booktuber. And today we are here after what to me feels like a long silence, but actually probably felt like nothing to you guys. I have been reading on the down low, I guess you could say. I've been reading the International Booker Long List 2024. Today just so happens to be April 5th and I have read 11 out of the 13 books. I have not been having a good time. This list may have broken me. I am, I've stood before the abyss and looked into the darkness that is the current state of translated literature. That sounds so dark. <laughs> Um, but yeah, I haven't been having a good time and instead of doing the individual book reviews, which I normally do, I figured I would just do one long video going through it. This is going to be long. Put your seatbelt on, get get a drink, do what you got to do, go to the restroom, whatever it may be, get a snack because I don't know how long this is going to be. I'm really exhausted by this list and I want to just run through it, start to finish, no cuts, raw, unfiltered. That's what we're doing. Um, disclaimers, as I said, I don't really like this list, so take everything that I say with a grain of salt as it is. Anyone who's speaking on the internet, you should take what they say with a mass, a huge like teaspoon of salt, yeah? Be careful, be cautious. Your mileage may vary, different strokes for different folks. Any kind of cliche that you can use, put it in right here. I do think that the order in which you read these books, your personal likes and dislikes does affect these things, what you're looking for when you come to a long list, all that comes to play when someone is giving their feedback and reactions to these books, I have come across some people who have felt differently than me and I have been shocked at what I've discovered when they tell me that they liked a book that I really disliked. It just really goes to show you that your mileage may vary. I don't know if I said that one. There's a lot of cliches one could use and at one point in my life, I would like to get to a point where I don't use any cliches, but we're not there just yet. So that's my major disclaimer. Like I didn't really enjoy this list. I do think that the order that I read them in affected this, but whatever. Oh, and what I wanted to say was that if you do actually want individual reviews on any of these books, let me know. I'm very amenable. If even one person is like, please give me an individual dedicated book review video, whatever on said book, I'll do it. But as of right now, I don't think I'm going to do that. We're just going to run through the list in the order that I read them. I will give you the information. I'm not going to be mentioning the authors and translators names. You can find all that information in the show notes. And I'll also timestamp things for your viewing ease if you would okay the first book that i read was undiscovered this is a book that is very slim it was 99 pages and i read it first because i was like let's just bang this out of the way let's just get this one over with that's what i want to say and i read it very quickly in, in the day that the long list came out which i think was march 10th took like about two hours uh this is autofiction and I really think that it should have been labeled memoir. I think for that reason I was really put off by the book. It is interesting but also not at the same time. Thematically we're looking at identity and colonization and desire. Those are kind of the three big motifs running throughout this novel, this very very brief slim little novel, which tells the story of our narrator, author, whoever it may be, our little protagonist who just so happens to have recently at the onset of the novel discover, find out that her father has passed away. So she goes back to Peru and while she's there, she's also reading about her familial lineage because her great, great grandfather, it is believed was a colonizer who came to Peru, traveled, wrote this big tome of a book describing his travels and then also, God, I've said travels a lot. And then also once he goes back to Paris, um, to France, his adopted country, because he's actually, I think, Austrian or something like that. He then takes the artwork that he brought back from him from Peru and gives it to France and then they put it in their museums. So she's like looking through that and looking at what it means that this man who also may have had some peculiar relationships with women and children, uh, what does that mean that this person is her ancestor? And then at the same time, she's also finding out more about her father and like really digging into the weeds of his sex life and that of her mother. And so all that's happening. And also an important detail that is worth noting is that, that the narrator of this book is Polly. So she is married to a man who comes from a similar background to her and then is also married to a woman who is white and lives in Spain, that, which is where our narrator currently lives. So there is also this undercurrent of like race relations in Spain and what that is like to be a woman from South America living in Spain. And some like uncomfortable moments definitely do come up. And then also um, a workshop on desire, decolonizing desire. And I think that this book is interesting. <laughs> no, I don't. <laughs> So this is a book that I felt as if it could have been a really great essay that if we had maybe focused and narrowed our scope would have been really interesting and it's kind of the perfect fodder for an article for the cut. 
and that's all I'm going to say there. The next book that I read was Crooked Plow. Crooked Plow is more of a typical story. It is told in three parts. It is looking at the tenant farmers in Brazil and this very like beautiful lush landscape where this one particular family is the focus of our story. They are unable to build proper houses they can't build houses of wood it needs to be of like mud and whatever so that means every time it rains or the weather's really bad like the house is gone they are unable to actually put down roots in this land even though basically their grandmother their grandparents their mother father is like children their subsequent lineage will all be born on this land and so this is a story that looks at in particular the relationship of two sisters part one we are looking at the older sister as she recounts this one incident of her childhood where her and her sister they're like about a year apart they were playing with their grandmother's things and they found a knife and this happens like within the first chapter okay and this knife they both are children playing with knives which as recipe for disaster right so they both put the knife in their mouth and the eldest sister ends up with just a cut on her tongue the other one tongue is gone chopped off gone and this is kind of the this is something that obviously affects them for the rest of their lives and the sisters become super super close where the one who can speak is then the mouthpiece for the younger one who can't speak and we're seeing their relationship we're seeing how they're adapting to this and then we're also seeing a rift that occurs because of jealousy and whatever i really didn't like this part i thought that was kind of a joke like it was gross whatever then in part two we're actually looking at the younger sister and we're getting her perspective she can't speak she doesn't have a voice but she kind of has this internal rage almost this um she's like a strong female character who can't be pushed around and she ends up marrying this guy that she thought was really nice and great but he's kind of a shitty person and we're seeing that and then we're seeing her like adapting to the way that the land is changing and the forces against them. And then part three switches completely. And we just so happen to be into the perspective of this kind of spirit, uh, an, an, an entity that is greater than any human. And we're seeing the final story kind of culminate and told through this lens. And the reason that this was done is because there is a very interesting undercurrent. There is an interesting, there is an interesting undercurrent of spirituality running throughout this text because these tenant farmers have taken the the religion of their forefathers and you know the slaves who came through on the ships and made it their own and it is like a very vibrant part of their community the father of the two twins the two girls rather they're not twins but they might as well be uh he is a respected figure and a healer and he is someone who is charismatic and great at what he does but also is kind of unable to do as much as he would like because he is at the mercy of the landowners and so we're seeing this relationship we're seeing the different uh, generation adopt to this and kind of get new ideas and have a desire for freedom and autonomy and we're seeing that develop i would say that this first half was really strong for me i was really with it this was story this was great we were learning about all of these characters and then towards the last third of the novel. It starts to feel like a history lesson and I don't like how the author tied everything up. It really graded me because there's one thing that I really disliked that may, really put me off the whole entire novel because I think that if this, if, if this was me, I would have done it completely different and it really bothered me a lot. And I, I'm not gonna go into it. This would have to happen in a separate video because I don't wanna include spoilers. like. You know, you're just here, no spoilers, most likely, unless I change my mind midway through. Okay, then the next book that I read after that was A Dictator Calls. Now, this is an interesting book because though it is supposedly fiction, it feels more like a writing experiment, writing exercise rather, and uh, or nonfiction, or creative nonfiction is actually what I would call this because our author, he is a former uh, international booker, long-listed author, he is looking at the conversation that occurred between Stalin and a poet. So basically, way back in 1934, Stalin called some poet. They had a three minute long conversation and was like, yo, what do you think about so and so? And he was like, he's no friend of mine. And this conversation gets dissected 12 different times. Essentially, this one conversation 
is then uh, told to another person who then tells it to another person and our author is looking at what it means that this story that this phone call kind of took on a life of its own and what were the different reasons a different person would have said it went like this versus this and so it's more like contemplative and meandering the first half there's part one and then part two which is a deep dive into the phone calls part one is very short about like 50 60 pages and it's it took me like 30 pages to really wrap my head around this because he kind of just plants you in it and you don't know what's going on in part one he's looking at the novel that he's currently working on this this big novel that's going to uh like really grapple with some tough stuff and he's meeting with his editor and then part two he's looking at the phone calls and there were moments within the phone calls where he's looking at the literary scene of the time which is really fascinating and there's definitely there was people that i like wrote down that i was like i need to look them up have i done that no and i read this probably a month ago so there's there's that but it was like interesting but also i don't think that this was fiction and so it confuses me why this was on the long list like yes it was interesting to read not something i would have picked up otherwise but also really baffling as to why it was on the long list Okay, after that, I read The Silver Bone. Now, if you were paying attention to International Booker last year, you would have seen the Jimi Hendrix book. This is by the same author. The Silver Bone is the first in a trilogy, a kind of murder mystery situation. The Silver Bone takes place in, I think, 1919. It is the end of World War I, the start of the Russian Civil War, and we are first page of the action certain action does happen our narrator's ear is cut off and his father is murdered before his eyes and that is our introduction to the hero of this novel he is really young studied to be an engineer but doesn't have a job for like half the book and then ends up getting a job in um the police department as kind of like a cop some i don't know detective like i don't really know what his actual job title is but he got the job because he has really great penmanship and can write well so that's happening he's now an orphan and he is kind of like stumbling about and the novel is peculiar because multiple murders happen but the murder that is the important one for this murder mystery doesn't really happen until like i don't know more than halfway through the novel like every single time a murder happened i was like this is it this is the one this is this is the one that we're trying to figure out who did it but no that's not the case and instead this this narrator and this is kind of really similar to the Jimi Hendrix book this guy is just like running around the town he's going from one place to another place talking to all these different tailors his um neighbor is trying to fix him up and does end up fixing him up with this lady and it's just like silly and there's this undercurrent of magical realism because this ear the one that fell off in the first not fell off the one that was cut off in the first page is a magical ear so when the ear is in a different room he's still able to hear from this ear and learns that this plot is going on and so he's like trying to figure that out but it's weird it's a little convoluted and nothing really happens until the last 50 pages but i would say that this author does write really smooth like no complaints on the language level it's really easy to read this book you can do it in a day but I don't understand why this was long listed because it's really mid I guess you could say I, I don't really like to use language like that but it is what it is it's just after that I read White Knights White Knights is the only short story collection to have made it onto the long list this is a bunch of interconnected short stories that is looking at the lived realities of this one particular isolated kind of remote village in Poland and our characters are all down and out they are struggling there's not a lot of progress material options in their life this is a story where people are dying like all the time and if it's 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 either death it's suicide there's a persistent theme of heat at the same time that there are a few short stories that take place in winter where like coldness is really emphasized but the rest of the stories are all they it was really interesting to me to see how like the summer heat and no AC like that was a really prevalent um, vibe, like very atmospheric in this book. I think the writing is really good. I enjoyed this one. It's very trippy and there's lots of despair. And I actually think it pairs quite nicely with the next book that I read, which was Not a River. This is very short, probably also 
this might actually be the shortest book on the long list or it's the second shortest this is fragmentary stories of um I don't know where I left off, but Not a River, it is fragmentary and it takes a look at masculinity in this one particular area in Argentina that is like kind of remote. But it is interesting because there are, it is similar, I think. I thought it was like in perfect dialogue with White Knights. It is looking at these three guys, masculinity, as I mentioned, these, these three guys, two older gentlemen, and their kind of adopted nephew who was one of their former friends who died, his, his son. And so they are not wealthy and whatever, and they happen to go to the spot that they always visit quite often to go fishing and just like have a boys weekend. And while they're there, they kind of make um, the locals mad. And at the same time, we're getting perspectives from the locals. There are these two girls, there is this mother, their mother and then their uncle, and we're learning more about them and we're switching points of view very, very quickly. And heat is obviously very important in this novel too because it takes place in the summertime and is really hot. You're taking long naps in order to like alleviate some of the heat. There's nothing else that you can do. There's smoking, drinking, revelry, but also just this undercurrent of the reality that there isn't a lot of progress that can be made in your life, that the options are limited and things are stacked against you. And as the novel reaches its final conclusion, it takes on a very interesting, almost uh, parable-like quality or fairy tale. It's very otherworldly in that regards. And I think both White Knights and Nodder River were really interesting to me because they were about death and despair, heat and fire. And the endings are kind of very similar, which I thought was quite interesting that these two novels are looking at different parts of the world, yet still have heat and hot weather, like extreme hot weather is such a big part of them and also kind of end very similar. So that's that book. Then after that, we have Kairos, which was one of the longer books. It's about 300 pages, and it is the story of an age gap relationship where the age gap relationship between a 50-year-old man and a 20-year-old girl is also acting as a metaphor for the relationship between uh, East Berlin and West Berlin. And at times, as this relationship progresses, it is an eight-year-long relationship, which really makes no sense why this girl would have been with this man for that long but as a relationship progresses you're struck by the, how abusive this relationship is it is it gets really dark and we're really stuck in it like it gets really intense it was kind of uncomfortable and the re the relationship is at the foreground of the novel and and in the background is the current state of the GDR and how things are changing how people are leaving or trying to leave or just dealing with the lack of material access that they have. And you kind of wish that things were switched and the elements of the GDR like were focused on more than this relationship between this old man and this young lady whose parents are down for her to be with this guy when he's literally beating her and ripping apart any shred of self-respect and self-worth she may have had and yeah what they have in common is their love of classical music i don't know it was kind of weird and also this guy's married and he has a kid and then we kind of find out towards the end a secret about him that's supposed to somewhat help explain the way that he was the way that he was does that make sense uh, as a child he was also in the H hitler youth program situation so that like gives you some context and it's also one of the things that we learn about him very early on in the novel I would say is that his first experience of sexual excitement was when he was a youth at the dentist's office sitting in the waiting room and he happens to hear a girl scream so that like gives you a little bit of an understanding of his psyche and though the relationship is such a big part of this novel. It is actually more of a character study on him than it is a look at like the girl. Like the girl kind of fades into the background, but the way that it's told is really, the writing is like really good here. I think it's the strongest in terms of the writing out of all of the books. 
our author is really focused in on these two characters and we're kind of switching from their points of view sometimes within the same sentence and it's very like focused in on them at the same time there still are moments because these two are like supposedly in love where they say things that are just so embarrassing but it's fine that's that book after that we have the details which is another one of those kind of auto fiction -y books this is a story very very short as well of a woman who has a fever and while she has this fever she is looking back at the people in her life who are no longer there uh part one it is looking at to be honest i kind of forget this one the most i think which is bad <laughs> um i don't remember who part one was about but at one point she's looking at a former roommate that she had who was a hot mess then there was a man she had a brief fling with and then who was the first one i know who the last one is and i'm not going to tell you because i do think it's worth reading for that because of how that's done but she's kind of looking at life in the 90s because this is this is a story of the 90s and y2k and the New Year's Eve party that happens before um, 2000s kicks off is like a big deal. And at the same time, one of the things that she's doing while she's dissect dissecting these characters is that she would be like, well, back then we just said that they were kind of like a wild child. But if it was right now in this day and age, we would say that so-and-so was BPD or whatever it was. Like that's kind of a thing that comes up quite a bit. I don't know how intentional that was, but that was something that I noticed. And what this author did really successfully, I thought she did this twice where she dropped in um, t two like moments of revelation that I thought were very masterfully done. They were so subtle that I kind of had to read back and be like, wait, what? I thought that was really good. And I can't even, I can't even tell you because that would be a spoiler, but I thought that was interesting. But for the most part, the, the writing is like smooth and easy. It's very forgettable, forgettable. I just didn't care. That's it. After that, I read What I'd Rather Not Think About. This is another short vignette style, very, very like easy to read, compulsive. I read this in like one or two goes because I just couldn't put it down because it's so easy to just keep on reading. It would probably take you like two hours max. This is a story of twins, a boy and a girl. And when we find our narrator, we discover that she is grieving because her brother committed suicide and now she is forced to face the reality of a life alone when she had always expected to have been able to have her brother by her side and so we're tracing the relationship moments from their childhood um, as well as the months leading up to the event there was a rift in their relationship at one point when the brother decides to uh, go to south america for a year by himself and we're seeing that um the author also has an obsession, the, not the author, I don't know, maybe the author as well, but the <laughs> protagonist of the novel has an obsession with Survivor. It was something that her and her brother both watched together. They're also really obsessed with 9-11 from a young age. They'd always been fascinated by suicide. It is something that comes up quite often in their conversations. And so that's going on as well. And I would say it's very... If you have siblings, it will probably really like tug at your heartstrings to just think of living life without one of your like it's you know it, it does she did a really great job in that regards but towards the end i kind of started to lose the plot there's also these moments where she goes off on tangents about things that she's reading on wikipedia and it's like bro i don't fucking care i have my own wikipedia links to read i don't need yours as well um but towards the end i thought that i wanted more because i do think that the children's relationships with their parents was really important and something we should have dissected a lot more. The mother didn't really love the daughter as much as she loved the son. The father ends up leaving them very early. And those were threads that I think we should have explored a little bit more. I think there could have been a bit more meat on this book. After that, I read Lost on Me and it was, excuse me, I'm gonna have to go there. It was Lost on Me, why this book was longlisted. Uh, one of the blurbs on the back of the book mentions how 100,000 copies were sold in Italy at the time that this book was launched. There is also described as being very similar to Fleabag or for fans of Fleabag. And I think they're really doing Fleabag dirty because this book, Fleabag is very dark, very humorous, but also very focused on this, the woman, whatever her name is, Fleabag, right? Uh, focused on her life in her 20s, like in that moment. But this character, this narrator is 
Also, this is autofiction. I don't know if I mentioned that. This author, narrator, person is looking at their childhood as well as their 20s and their life to present day and giving us all of these details about their family that honestly were just like, your family's batshit crazy. I don't care that your boobs haven't grown, never grew, and that your grandmother said your boobs aren't big enough to even fill an espresso cup and just things like that, like all these details. She had constipation as a kid, like I don't fucking care. That's how I felt about this book. I did this on two times speed because I just was not interested. And it's kind of, the overarching thing is it's how she's trying to escape her family and also abscond from any responsibility and has a tick for almost lying, you know? She'll just lie for ease, for the sake of ease. Like, I don't know. It was just really hard for me to be down with this book. This is just, like, I'm not the target audience for this book. And yeah, there was a lot of like catchphrases that were thrown throughout the book. Like the father had this saying that he would say the paradox does not exist, something like that. Every time the mother would call because the mother was overbearing and a bit of a narcissist, she would harass these kids when they were at parties or whatever, calling them. I don't know. <laughs> no. Oh my God. The worst part of the book, actually, I just remembered. So she's 19 years old and she goes to her boyfriend. I'm ready to lose my virginity. Like I'm ready. Let's do it. And he looks at her and he's like, what do you think we've been doing? And I was just baffled how we could have gotten to that point that like that could have happened because another common theme throughout this book is almost how um, light sexual abuse there is in the regards that at one point when she was a child, a supposed uncle came up to her in the bathroom and was like, do you want to suck my dick? And she's like, no. And then she's on the train at one point and some guy puts his dick in her hand. And then at another point when she's walking to school at a, as a very young age, she gets flashed. And then she's sitting on the beach and some guy's like just standing there night naked next to her. Like this is a really common theme throughout this book. I think those are kind of the main instances where this happens, but all that stuff is happening. And also she does mention that her and her friends were watching porn together. And I'm like, how did you get to a point where you're 19 years old and you're like unsure what sex is? I just found that really baffling. I didn't get on with it, this book. Anyways, after that, I read Sympatia. This is the book that I finished yesterday. This is looking at Venezuela and our narrator. This is like an absurd little novel. It is very hard to pin down. We start off with our narrator finding out that his wife has left the country. In this novel, at this current political time that the novel is taking place, so many people are leaving Venezuela. The, it is very tough in the country. Food is hard to get your hands on unless you're wealthy and of the elite. And as a result of all the people that are leaving, there are many, many dogs that are left on the street and unable to be cared for. They're abandoning their dogs. And so our narrator in the very beginning of the novel finds out that his wife has left him. She's left the country and she's like, we're over. It's done for. And so he is not sad because actually the whole time he's thinking about a girl from his past and how he wished he had done more with her blah 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 and we find out that he is really close to his father-in-law his father-in-law kind of was a bit of a eccentric man who towards the end of his life refused to speak to his two children the daughter and the twin brother and so it's interesting because he's so close to the son-in-law and ends up giving the son-in-law his house under the stipulation that he needs to turn the house and the, the house into a dog shelter for abandoned dogs. So he's like racing, he's racing against the clocks in order to do that. While that is happening, the love of his life comes back into his life and she is kind of helping this process, but also giving manic pixie e-girl vibes because sometimes she disappears and she is learning more about um, the father-in-law's family life and there's so many things that are happening and at the same time the novel just like goes on these weird tangents like it's, it's kind of like plot plays a role here because every time something's kind of going well-ish or like happening something random happens that completely derails everything and it's unusual, but I do think that it's interesting because 
It is. <laughs> That's not very helpful. I do think, I think actually what I do think, this novel would have been a lot better had there been less gratuitous like inclusions of sex. Like, it was so bad. It was comical like writers shouldn't be writing about sex like it's really embarrassing there was this one line where nadine who's the love of the narrator's life comes back and like they have this conversation and he answers a question and she's like bingo you just earned yourself a blow job and it's like you then two pages later is it's like i can't i can't even like say them because who knows what kind of ai is going to be watching these videos and doing things with but those moments were really bad and it really detracted from the novel. At one point, the narrator has a dream that the love of his life, because now she's disappeared for like a week or something like that. So he has a dream that her vagina had a gold coin in it, which then becomes a cave. And I don't know, it's just weird. And then after that, we have two more books, okay? That I have not read. It is The House on Via, The House on Via Gemito, whatever. I think I will read that because I did buy that. Uh, and then we have Matter to Ten which I don't know if I will read. I think one of those books is definitely going to be on the short list. It just has to be. I like have a feeling. I just don't know which one. So that's where we're at. This is the video. Those are my thoughts. I will definitely do a video, I think, possibly, talking about my short list predictions because I do have thoughts. I also have recommendations for what I do think you should read. So I'll kind of do like a predictions and also what I think is worth your time. And yeah, that's, this year's long list for you it was it was a list books were read i'll see you guys later bye